Hello, and welcome to the A-Level RE Flipped Learning Podcast. Today's talk is about language games, and we'll focus on the work of Ludwig Wittgenstein. It follows on from my previous three talks on religious language, where we looked at the challenges posed by verification and falsification, and the responses to those challenges from John Hick, R.M. Hare, and Paul Tillich. The idea of this talk is for you to listen, take notes if you wish to, and then respond to the retrieval questions afterwards. You can stop and replay this at any time to make sure you understand what I'm talking about. I'm going to assume that you have some prior knowledge of philosophy, but be aware there are quite a lot of technical terms which we'll need to look at closely to ensure we understand what's being said. There are also some reflection questions which are intended to be used for a class discussion following this talk. However, it might be useful to have a think about them and jot down some of your ideas in response to them in preparation for your next lesson. So far in this mini-series, we've looked at whether religious language is cognitive, that is, factual, or non-cognitive, language that's not intended to be taken literally. If you remember, both Ayer and Flew dismissed religious language as being meaningless because they assumed that the statements believers make are cognitive. As such, they fail to stand up to logical scrutiny and they cannot be verified or falsified. Both Ayer and Flew had a realist approach to language. Realism is about what's real. When it comes to describing objects or talking about something, there is a truth which can be established. This means that it ought to be possible to establish who's correct and who is incorrect. Either the ball is red or the ball is blue. Either God exists or God doesn't exist. Hare and Tillich both responded to this challenge by proposing that religious language is non-cognitive. When believers talk about their faith, they're not making factual assertions. They're expressing a deeper, more fundamental truth which is true and real for them. It taps into and gives expression to a particular way in which they can comprehend their place in the universe. In today's talk, we're going to look at the ideas of Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein was born in Vienna in 1889, and as a young man, he went to Cambridge to study mathematics under Bertrand Russell. Initially, Wittgenstein was a logician, a mathematician who applied the laws of logic to philosophy. In 1921, his book The Tractatus was published. It's an incredibly short book, it's only 75 pages long, but its aim was to reveal the relationship between language and the world, what can be said about it and what can only be shown. Wittgenstein argued that the logical structure of language provides the limits of meaning. The limits of language for Wittgenstein were the limits of philosophy. What we can say at all can be said clearly, he argues. Anything beyond that, religion, ethics, aesthetics, the mystical, cannot be discussed. They are not in themselves nonsensical, but any statement about them must be. If this sounds a little familiar, then it should do. The Tractatus is generally regarded to be the inspiration behind the Vienna Circle, the group of scientists, philosophers and mathematicians of which A.J. Ayer was once a member. This early philosophy of Wittgenstein is commonly referred to as picture theory. Wittgenstein argued that for statements to be meaningful, they must correspond with something we can clearly see in the world. It reflects a state of affairs which we can see as being true or false. So statements like, the cat is on the mat, or there's a squirrel in the tree, are meaningful because they paint a picture of a possible state of affairs which corresponds to the world. For this early Wittgenstein, the world is made of atoms, and reality is composed of those atoms, and so our language is restricted to the number of possible ways in which those atoms can be arranged. To go beyond the physical is to stray into the nonsensical. Of course, we've seen this approach reflected in the logical positivism of Aya, and we've already considered its problems and its limitations. However, perhaps its biggest critic was Wittgenstein himself. Just ten years after the Tractatus was published, Wittgenstein began to change his mind. However, it wasn't until his later book, Philosophical Investigations, was published posthumously in 1953, 
that his new philosophy was fully revealed, standing in direct contrast to his strictly logical, cognitive approach which had come before. For this later Wittgenstein, his early picture theory had failed to capture the complexity and the richness of language. Wittgenstein recognised that when we talk of beauty, love, poetry, religion or art, we seem to understand each other and this shows we cannot be talking nonsense as he had earlier suggested. Instead, Wittgenstein argued that there can be no one singular meaning behind a word or a sentence because there are so many ways in which it can be meaningful. In addition to this, there are a multitude of functions for the language that we use. We can use language to give orders, describe objects, tell jokes, tell stories, ask, thank, greet, swear, pray, etc. So if we want to know the meaning of a word, we need to look for how it is being used. According to later Wittgenstein, the mistake of the logical positivists made was to think meaning lay only in factual significance. Both Ayer and Flew made a mistake in thinking that language which was being used in one sense, the religious sense, should be treated in the same way as when it's being used in a different sense, scientific. This later philosophy of Wittgenstein laid out in investigations is commonly referred to as language games. Science, maths, poetry, sport and religion are all examples of different games where the language being used is specific to the context or as Wittgenstein calls it, the form of life. Think about the following words, try, draw, dribble. What do those words mean to you? They could mean a range of different things depending on the context. If you enjoy rugby or football or basketball, then these words might have a specific meaning within the context of that particular game. But if you're not into sport, then they probably mean something quite different. The point that Wittgenstein makes is that the language that is used within a particular context or form of life is not intended to have the same meaning when it's used in a different context. This means that a statement made by a scientist can have a different meaning altogether when used by an artist. Neither one is more correct than the other. Rather, the validity of the statement is judged by other people who also understand the context. So a group of artists can have a meaningful and insightful discussion among themselves about form and perspective, which can't be judged by anyone else unless they're also part of the art world. So language can be used accurately or inaccurately within the game, but its primary purpose is not to make factual statements. It's about communicating meaning to other players in the same game. The players of one game cannot criticise the way in which language is used as part of another. They cannot enter into the game without first learning the rules and conventions of the language. Peter Padden's famous explanation of cricket to a foreigner illustrates the importance of knowing how the language works in context before trying to work out the meaning. He says, each man that's in the side that's in goes out and when he's out he comes in and the next man goes in until he's out. When they're all out, the side that's out comes in and the side that's been in goes out and tries to get out those coming in. Within the game of cricket, the words in and out are used in a quite different way from how they might be used in poetry. It's a mistake to assume that the use of one word is better or more fundamental than another. If we want to know the meaning of a word or the meaning of language, we should look at how it's used. As Wittgenstein called it, meaning is use. So as far as religious language goes, Wittgenstein was suggesting that it's meaningful when understood within the context of religion, within the context of its own game. Those who don't play the game cannot understand the context in which the language is being used, and so they're not in a position where they're able to judge its coherence. They can't say whether the language has meaning or not, because they don't play the game. Outsiders who hear the language will not understand it, and they're likely to make a category mistake in presuming that the meaning is the same as when it's used in a different game.
So when the logical positivists and the early Wittgenstein argued that it's nonsensical to talk of God existing, the later Wittgenstein would say that the word existence is being used in a different way to the way it's used when we talk about squirrels in trees. And unless you too are a believer, you cannot comprehend the true meaning of the term God exists. The logical positivists adopt a realist position. You may have wondered why I place so much emphasis on what realists are claiming. Realism is about what's real. When it comes to describing objects or talking about something, there's a truth which can be established. But what Wittgenstein is proposing is an anti-realist view of God and religion. Peter Vardy, in his 1995 book, The Puzzle of God, says, the truth of an anti-realist claim is based on coherence. God exists is true not because the word God refers to an everlasting being or a timeless substance, but rather because the phrase God exists has a use and a purpose within the form of life of a believing community. According to Wittgenstein's language game theory, when a religious believer says God exists, they are confirming their belief in God as a reality in their life. It's a declaration of faith. Unless you're a believer, you can't understand what this means. It comes down to a particular way in which you perceive the world. You're not just seeing things, you are seeing as, depending on your perspective, the form of life to which you belong. I may see a hodgepodge collection of mismatched shapes. You may see Picasso's powerful expression of suffering brought about by war. I may watch a football match and see some guys kicking a ball about. You may be seeing the most exciting football match in the world. I may see an unmade bed. You may see Tracy Emin's modern masterpiece. I may see a duck. You may see a rabbit. The point is, neither of us is right or wrong. We're simply operating within different forms of life, which in turn influence the way in which we interpret our experiences. However, those different ways of seeing things can have a profound impact on the way in which we interpret our entire life. Suppose someone were a believer and said, I believe in a last judgment. And I said, well, I'm not so sure, possibly. You would say there is an enormous gulf between us. If he said, there is a German aeroplane overhead, and I said, possibly, I'm not so sure. You would say we're fairly near. Wittgenstein's point here is that the difference between these two statements is in the impact they have on the person's life. The prospect of a last judgment will have much more bearing on the life of a believer than the observation of an aeroplane. The response of possibly to the idea that the aeroplane is German is appropriate. The same response to the idea of last judgment is not. It's of infinite significance to the believer. It's not just something we'll be able to verify at some stage. It has an impact on the whole life of the person. To treat those two statements as equivalent is to make what Wittgenstein calls a category mistake. They're clearly not using the language in the same sense. So what are we saying? Well, what Wittgenstein and other anti-realists are saying is that God exists, but God does not exist out there in the same way that squirrels exist out there. To a religious believer, the statement God exists means more than there is a God. It's a positive affirmation that they are entering into a life of faith. Again, this isn't the first time we've considered this kind of idea. In the episode on myth and symbol, I mentioned D. Z. Phillips, who said in his 1970 book, Death and Immortality, that the term eternal life should not be understood in terms of living forever, but as expressing a quality of existence achievable in the present. Phillips, along with Stuart Sutherland, argues that biblical references to eternal life are not intended to be understood as more life after death, but instead should be understood as a quality of existence. The human experience is not about securing a place in heaven, but about establishing the kingdom of God on earth. It's about striving to achieve our potential as moral beings. Therefore, being in the kingdom 
is not a physical reference at all. It means adopting the correct moral attitude. Luke 17.21 says, Nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. DZ Phillips here is presenting the idea of the kingdom of God from an anti-realist perspective. The kingdom of God is a present reality, a moral attitude adopted by those who choose to live their life according to the ideals of Christianity. The purpose of human existence is to work towards establishing the kind of world where all humans can flourish and can achieve their potential as moral beings. The extent to which you achieve this potential determines the value of your life. Here Phillips is pushing back against the idea that the purpose of Christian life is to get into heaven. If heaven, God, angels, etc. have no external reality, Christianity is just one way of expressing and illustrating values which are true for me. Fadi again. God exists. God really, really, truly, truly exists. But God does not exist as a creator who is distinct from the world. He is not some being who is apart from the world and who sustains and acts in it. God is a reality within the believing community. This is rather similar to Hare's ideas about Blix, which we looked at in my previous podcast. This is also an anti-realist perspective because it's claiming that what's true is true for me. It corresponds to the way in which I see the world and understand my place within it. My blick is the lens through which I interpret my experiences and the context which gives meaning to my life. What Wittgenstein does is place this within boundaries, rules of the game. This means that there are claims about God which would be rejected as false. They would be deemed false if they do not meet the criteria of coherence within the game. That is, if they break the rules of the game. So a Christian can't claim the devil is good, for example, just as a footballer can't claim to have scored a try. This ought to be regarded as a strength of language game theory. There are boundaries over the correct use of the language. Truth is relative and the truth or falsity of claims is judged against the context, not on whether they are inherently true or false. As statements are non-cognitive and not intended to be regarded as factual, we avoid pitching conflicting claims against one another there's no longer the idea that I am right, therefore you are wrong. Instead, once the scientist and the believer recognise that they are expressing different forms of life and are not contradicting one another, then dialogue is possible. This is perhaps crucial when we think about the creation-evolution debate. Both sides are referring to the same thing, the origins of life, but the way in which they're doing so depends on their own particular form of life. However, there are significant problems. Within Christianity, there's a strong sense of mission, that is, evangelism and outreach, bringing the word of God to all people everywhere. In Mark 15, 16, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. It's clear that Christianity is not supposed to be an exclusive club, only understood by those who are initiated. In addition, Wittgenstein says that the language used can only be understood and criticised by someone within the game itself. This implies that each form of life is equally valid, whether it's an established mainstream religion, a fundamentalist organisation, or a cult. There's no objective means of scrutinising the language used. And to the vast majority of religious believers, God exists, as in, out there. There really is a God who listens and responds to prayers, who interacts with his creation and with whom believers will be reconciled after death. In fact, the centrality of the real prospect of judgment and consequent afterlife is fundamentally important to many Christians. Without this, there's no sense of divine justice and no satisfactory solution to the problem of evil. Again, it's important to return to the concept of central truth claims within Christianity. An anti-realist position will claim that the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ were not necessarily historical events. They are, as Boltman and Hick maintain, metaphors or myths. Most Christians would not be happy to adopt this position. 
Believers may undoubtedly use non-cognitive language as a tool for expressing the ineffable, but at the heart of their faith lie fundamental cognitive truths. Thank you for listening to today's talk. On the A-Level RE blog you'll find all the accompanying teaching resources and you can subscribe to my YouTube channel to listen with the PowerPoint slides. Don't forget you can also follow A-Level RE on Facebook and Twitter too. See you next time.